Disclaimer, this podcast is for general information only and is not intended to provide care or medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Welcome to Barbell's Business and Boobs, where we discuss navigating life at everyday lifters, business owners, and being a woman in a male-dominated industry. We are so excited to welcome our guest, Stacey Vio. Stacey is a board-certified psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner and doctor of nursing practice. Christy and I's last episode, if you had a chance to listen to it, was all about mental health struggles and our own journeys with medication. We both have tried various interventions over the course of our life, and Christy was brave enough to share her story of how she actually got off anxiety medications, and I've dabbled with various ADHD medications. So yeah, welcome, Stacey. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, guys. This is exciting. This is like my first real podcast, so. (laughs) That's awesome. Okay, so we kind of just want to first go over mental health struggles and the shifting landscape since basically 2020. So Stacey, from your perspective, how would you say your job and your patients and just the whole view on pharma interventions has changed since 2020, since obviously COVID, Mm -hmm. I can't believe it's already been four years. years. Exactly. How has that changed in your line of work? Um, I think, I think there's like a mixed bag. I think when 2020 rolled around prior to that, I did see like an uptick in people like, you know, taking care of their mental health, recognizing it, talking more about it, obviously, like not to the degree where we want to be. I don't think we're even there yet now in 2024. Um, but I think when 2020 hit, you had two things occurring. Um, you know, we went from like a very fast paced, go, go, go world. That's how like majority of us, myself included, my patients, we operated. Um, And when you have that, you you don't have a lot of time to like sit and reflect, right? Upon like our anxieties, our worries, or things that we need to adjust in our life. And then the pandemic comes and it forces us to like stop that. And now we're sitting there pretty much like for some people, depending on their job, doing like pretty much nothing. So now we're sitting with our thoughts. Now we're forced to having like to reflect and recognize our anxieties or our low moods or, you know, things that like need adjustment in our lives. They're staring right back at us. It's, it was impossible to just, you know, ignore and keep going like, you know, life before 2020 was. So that really, I think was the reason why mental health actually started like peaking and, you know, we reached kind of a level of a mental health crisis because so many people were just in their bathing in their thoughts and they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't have coping strategies and they didn't have enough distractors to be able to like keep avoiding and move forward. Right. So what are we doing? We're watching, you know, TikToks or, you know, on Instagram or Facebook and that really, or Snapchat. And that was like our life for so long, even like these, like, you know, Zoom meetings and stuff. So. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when we're doing that, you know, we start to, uh, we start to like doom scroll, we start to create a narrative in our head, and we start to spiral. So when we're not doing that, then we're sitting with our thoughts. So like the, the two was not a good recipe. And I definitely, um, I think I can say this for all mental health clinicians, like everything skyrocketed, people just had no idea, like how to cope and what to do. And even the best of my patients that could, you know, had all the skills and all the strategies were really crumbling because it was just too much time. It was so isolated and um, just too much time with our thoughts. So it definitely, um, definitely a big surge in mental health awareness after 2020, Um, you know, more so because we were on social media so much more and we weren't as distracted is is basically what I've come down to. Mm -hmm. I have to mention too, from knowing you, I know you wrote your thesis on the mental health effects of social media. And like you just said, many people were, cause they were at home working, just kind of yeah. doom scrolling. Is that, I don't know what year you were doing that, but was. <laughs> I actually had to, so I graduated in 2020 with my doctorate. So we didn't have anything like no, no ceremony, nothing. So I actually thank God wrapped up like my findings prior to that. So um, I focused 
on just general anxiety um, in 15 of my patients that, you know, um, participated in the study and three forms of social media. So is Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat, um, because you have to keep it really narrow for the Mm -hmm. DMP project. Um, And it was interesting, like 11 of the participants were female. So it was definitely a female dominant um, study. And what I had them do was, you know, do take a, they had to have a smartphone to participate in the study because the smartphone tells you how much time you're on like these applications. So what we did was prior to the start, we took like the data of like how many hours they spent on social media. Um, during this, I think it was, it was a six week period. So during this period of time, I basically asked them to like limit or like totally get off like social media entirely. Um, and we each, every two weeks, we would look at the time they spent on it, see if it's reduced, which everyone did a really good job complying with it. Um, and then they also took a, um, called it a, a GAD scale, which is a generalized anxiety scale. So it's, um, they took it prior to the start of the study and then every two weeks with it. Um, and what it showed was the first, the first two weeks, there was, um, like their baseline anxiety. And then like that, the second time we did it, there was a decrease in the anxiety. And a lot of them said like, you know, I do, I wasn't aware of how much I was on social media. Like the awareness mm-hmm. totally wasn't there, but this made them like more aware um, or how it was affecting like their themselves, like their, their image, how they felt their, you know, self-confidence, everything. Um, and how much less thing, anxiety that they had including also like how much better their mood was when they weren't using it all the time um interesting enough I wasn't like prepared for this but it was that third week that final kind of week the anxiety spiked actually in um and it was more because of like fear of missing out because they were you know not connected that they were fearing that they were missing out and that was like really increasing their anxiety so um, overall, like they notice that it's, it's a negative when they're on it all the time. Um, but because this is so much of our lives and how they stay connected, you know, there is that point where like, if they're not connected, that also influences their mood. So it's finding that, like, I, I think at the end of the day, that happy balance between the two. And I think everything's about balance anyway. So, um, yeah, yeah the hard part is too, cause it, that's so interesting because I, I want a happy balance because it does help me stay connected to you guys and have this podcast and all that fun stuff. But it's almost like addicting. Well, it mm-hmm. is addicting with the algorithms and how now they keep scrolling and stuff like that. So I could see how it would be hard to stop. And especially if you're young, like uh, missing out and stuff. I grew up in a time where, um, I mean, we're probably all the same age, but my sp- it was just like AIM and then MySpace yeah. and yeah, I had so yeah. much like I loved that and I was thinking I was like I loved that social media you put a bulletin up and see if people <laughs> respond to it but you didn't see who could see it you know you didn't feel there wasn't constant notifications you'd mm-hmm. have to log on a browser so I liked that balance a lot um but even that if I look back at my childhood of like that kind of did make me feel anxiety or want you know at least socially want to be cooler right yeah. so um I'm glad I grew up, I grew up like in the nineties mostly. Um, but yeah, did their anxiety, how long would it say their the anxiety go back down at all after that three week period? That's when it, end, uh, well, it was a total okay. of like six weeks. So it was two, mm-hmm. three week periods where we collected okay. the data. Um, so we ended on that last week. Um, and that's when their anxiety was like, a you know, a little bit more elevated because they had been limiting social media so much that they were, you know, fearing that they were missing out on like life and what was going on mm-hmm. and, and that. So that's kind of where we ended. I, this is awful. I didn't ever like publish my study or anything of that nature. Um, my goal was to like have it good enough to like graduate. And that's where <laughs> mm-hmm. I, what I did. Um, but the findings are, you know, all, all real, they're all there. Um, and I did all the research, but um, it was like an extra step to get it published. And I just had other things I wanted to do. Yeah. So. 
Well, if we ever do another one, I'm definitely willing to volunteer if you want to study because Christy and I have had this conversation so many times that we go back and forth. Like social media for us is a necessarily necessary evil. Like we have yeah. to keep a roof over, over our heads. And of course, there's so much good that comes along with it. And I'm not going to go into all that. We have plenty of episodes on that. But I definitely you know, I take like off grid days and I notice when I don't do those because of work mm-hmm. obligations, like my mental health truly does kind of go out the window with anxiety skyrocketing. So that's that. So sure. I yeah. kind of want to shift it's gears now case. so that, yeah. yeah, so that listeners understand a brief explanation of different types of medications commonly prescribed for mental health conditions like antidepressants, mood stabilizers, ADHD medication, mm-hmm. et cetera. If you could kind of just go in to a brief overview, but then also like from your perspective, how you decide what's best for the patient. I don't know if you have like a set of questions or how that yeah. looks, whatever you're comfortable sharing. Sure. Um, I think it's, I mean, every clinician is like, is very different. Um, but I started off doing this and I haven't, you know, digressed from it. It's all, it's really all about the patient and what it is like they feel comfortable doing. Um, this is like, it's all about listening and seeing like, you know, what your patient, you know, really needs. Um, and to determine that, like I go over everything from, from the history, whether it's general anxiety, depression, bipolar, um, schizophrenia, ADHD, um, eating disorders. Those are kind of like my main, you know, treatment um, population. Um, so I go through a background of history. I get, you know, the symptoms that they're, I run, you know, the symptoms that they're having. Um, I go over any like prior medication, you know, current medication. And this is like the history also includes a medical history. So I want to be like, very clear and I'm clear with my patients that like, you know, depression and anxiety um, are a disease of the brain, but they're also a disease of the body. Like people think that the brain and the body are just two separate entities and they're not, mm-hmm. they're all in one. So like when we're, you know, suffering mentally, it's going to affect us physically. And when we're having physical ailments, it's going to affect us mentally. So it's like very important to to know that connection um, and also get that medical history um, as well. Um, make sure like, you know, there's like, they go through a trauma background, um, see like what they're using for coping skills and strategies at this point where they're like, you know, eating habits are at their sleep wake cycle is huge. I think that's number one in my book um, for, you know, making sure that that's in a good place. Um, You know, they're, what they're eating, um, you know, how healthy is it? Because what we put into our body is huge. So if we're fueling our body with like, junk food or, you know, just like not the healthiest choices or even not at all. Um, and we're expecting our body to perform and our brain to perform at optimal level. It's never going to work. Um, so all of these things go into, into play their academic history. Um, you know, what they're struggling with, like socially, um, as well. So, and then also, um, past family history because genetics is also, you know, a big, big part of this too. Um, And then their current environment, like, you know, what they're in, um, where they're living, you know, what they like to do for fun. So I think it's an all in like encompassing piece. I think that's something that maybe people who are not um, seeking treatment or have never sought treatment or have had just had the wrong providers don't like, that's how it should be. It should be everything. It should be like universal. You should get a coverage on because everything affects your mental health. It's not just like, here are the symptoms and let's give you a medication. I mean, I prescribe medication, but I don't, I don't push medication on anyone. Um, and I also don't think it's warranted for everybody either. Um, so how I decide if someone is a candidate for medication is if, you know, anxiety, depression, ADHD, bipolar, whatever it may be, um, I think we can all take a like self scale and we're all going to qualify for something, you know, we're all going to have some sort of anxiety or low mood or symptoms of ADHD, like, we're just all going to have it. It's just a matter of how impactful it is to our everyday life, right? So if I have somebody that's sitting in front of me saying like, you know, I'm really anxious, I'm having panic attacks all the time. Um, But their, you know, sleep wake cycle is junk, 
you know, they're not eating properly, they're not exercising, um, they're not doing anything to help themselves. There's going to be two things that I'm going to have to decide at that point. One, can they do those things? Or two, can they can't, right? So they can't access that stuff. So if someone can't access those strategies to be able to like rectify these crucial things for our everyday life, then that's where I determine a medication could be beneficial. Because what that's telling me is someone like knows the stuff, but they can't access it and they need to kind of bridge that gap. And that's where medication can be a tool to get to the other side, to be able to use, to implement those skills and strategies into everyday life. Um, or if I have a patient that does all the things, they eat right, they exercise, they sleep well, they have like great social support, great, you know, all the things, but they're like, Stacy, I'm just hitting a wall. Like nothing is working. My anxiety is still through the roof or I'm, you know, I still have low moods, but like why I'm doing everything right. And I think that's probably like, that's really frustrating because you're like, what else can I do? Um, and that's another example of like when medication would be ideal to bridge that gap. Um, so when you're introducing, you can stop me at any point if this is like too much. Um, when you're introducing medication, I'll just take anxiety and depression. Um, SSRIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors are usually the go-to um, because serotonin is usually the the first neurotransmitter that's, you know, off when someone has unmanageable anxiety or unmanageable depression. Um, so this is where I think mental health gets like very gray for people is the reason why, why do we use these medications? What's the purpose? Um, and everybody that comes to me is like, I don't want to like change who I am. Everybody has this stigma of these medications creating like zombie like figures in the corner. Um, just from history. And I, and I understand that. And it's a history of being over medicated and all of that. And I want to, you know, I love educating because I want to get away from that. Um, the goal is to never change who you are. Like any medication, I want to be like clear, any, any medication can change your personality, pretty much anything. Doesn't, doesn't have to be psychiatric medication. It can be antibiotics. It can be Advil. It does, you know, there's, there's effects there. Um, I don't want anyone to not feel like themselves. It actually defeats the entire purpose of like, if someone's dulled out cognitively or emotionally, um, then they can't feel anxiety or low mood. So how are they supposed to deal with it? Right. So this, the other com component with SSRIs is they don't take away the anxiety or the depression. They give you clarity in the brain for you to be able to access tools and skills in order to learn how to manage anxiety and depression. So if I have somebody that wants that instant gratification or instant fix, you're not getting it with SSRIs. Like you're not getting it from me because you have to do the hard work on the other end. And if you're not willing to do that hard work, it's virtually going to seem like the SSRIs are doing nothing because it's the combination. Like medication is such a small component of it. Um, but regardless of what we're treating, we're looking for that clarity in the brain because we want to be able to access those strategies and skills. Thank you so okay. much for mentioning the brain body connection and how it's all encompassing as well as some of the stigmas, you know, last week when we published our episode, I got some great feedback and then so not so great feedback, but Christy and I are in no way against medication, but we are, you know, and I'm not trying to speak for anyone, but we're all us three are all in healthcare, just in, you know, mm -hmm. various ways. Yeah. And again, because I come from a pharma background, when I ask my clients like for a weekly summary, I don't try to play NP, you know, but I do try and work for that whole like mind body connection. Yeah. And so from your perspective, I know Christy does the same thing. How do you explore like complementary therapies and lifestyles? So I know a lot of times people I'm assuming they come to me, want a quick fix. Like, why aren't I losing mm. weight? Why aren't I getting strong quick? And it's like, well, it's a process. So how do you deal if you have the patient that's just like, well, I want this and I want it to work? Um, I, I mean, I think you know me at this point, I'm very straightforward and I'm like, you know, I'm and blunt. Like, well, that's not going to happen. You know, it's, you got to work for it. Like this is years of you acting, behaving, 
in a certain way that needs to be undone. So you need to like trust the process, have grace, have some compassion for yourself um, and know that you have the supports. I like, you know, I don't like to just be, you know, I, I like to hold hands a little bit with people, but I also need to, you know, also give them a reality check um, and let them know that I'm here to support and I understand, but this is an, an encourage, like this is the work you have to do. Like if you want to, the goal is to always come off these medications, right? I know like, Christy, you're on it for 20 years, which is insane to me. Um, you know, not that I don't have patients that are on medication long-term, there are a certain population that just, you know, they try to come off of them and they can't. And that's, you know, really because that is the chemical component where that serotonin is not working the way it needs to. So there is a population that do require to have it. It's not a bad thing. It's just another tool, but like long-term, you know, I always try to get my patients off the medication or decreased, you know, at least within like six months to a year of being on it um, and stable and doing well. So like, it's, it's difficult. So the goal is like you, you know, you want this medication to work, but you have to do the work too. And, and I start with just saying like, look, start with your sleep wake cycle, go to bed at a certain time and wake up at a certain time. And let's just focus on that for the next month. Like, cause a month's going to form that habit. And then we'll add on another thing versus me throwing out like, okay, you got to do the sleep. You got to do the eating. You got to do the exercise. No, I'm going to pick the most important thing that has to be done first. So if their sleep is really good, then I'll go to the physical activity or, you know, the diet. Um, but I chunk it away like month to month so that they feel like, okay, they're in, in that time, they're accomplishing things, which is building their confidence. Um, and honestly, like once you start doing that and they start, you know, just with that sleep wake cycle and they gain that confidence and it becomes almost a domino effect. Like I don't really have to do much after that because they're seeing the benefits to it. Yeah. And I, I really, really appreciate, appreciate your approach and being so holistic because my situation is just a product of, in my opinion, is just like, I feel like back then, I mean, everything's evolving so fast. I feel like yeah. more people are thinking a little bit more like you holistically, hopefully, you know, because we have so much more, we can prioritize, you know, health and wellness so much and like exercising mm -hmm. and sleep. Like you said, I love like, you're like, first sleep. And I'm like, yes, that's even for like strength training. Like if your sleep's yep. not there, how are you going to progress? So, you know, I'm kind of my message and I, and I haven't, I haven't gotten too many comments about it. I'm curious about comments Brittany got about it. Cause I'm not anti-medication. I love that the stigma is gone, but it was almost like too far where it's like, I'm getting so many ads on like, I can just yeah. want to app FaceTime a doctor and get medication. Like you said, mm -hmm. it takes the work. And Although I was a medicated for so long, I was still, I had access to really good therapy at first. I've also had psychologists or psychiatrists who would just go down a checklist, say, do you want to off yourself? Do you want to harm yourself? Do you want to harm so others? Crazy. And then, oh, here's a new medicine. And this is when yeah. I was younger, um, you know, and I definitely don't play with my parents for this. They, they were doing everything they could to help me because I really did need that immediate, I needed some kind of like sedative or something. I was, I was going through a crisis, right? So well, you need it. You need uh, and then I did, I did get, I did get the tools to, but it was kind of like in an era more of like, all right, like, let's keep you, you know, you're, you're going through puberty. You're a little depressed. Let's, is there in the antidepressant? Okay. I, I want to get off, but it's hard to get off. Now I have, now I'm going to college. I don't want to change anything, you know, mm -hmm. now I'm moving and now I'm starting my career and all this stuff. So it's never the right time. So I'm definitely, and I, you know, I feel like sometimes we get a little bit of um, backlash for people don't listen to the whole podcast. Like, my, you're anti this because you don't agree with this. Definitely not. I'm just saying if you were my position and you are so hopeless that you'll never be able to not have to go to CVS and get a prescription and pay mm -hmm. a lot for it as a self-employed person, yeah. there's hope. Like, it was hard, you know? So yeah. I'm, I want people to, you know, I know that we're like in strongman and powerlifting, but at the base of it, I just want people to be healthy. And like you said, like mm -hmm. the learning those coping mechanisms, like I'm glad I still, I still struggled during COVID, but I'm glad I knew what a panic attack was. And I've experienced yeah. that before COVID because I have, you know, family members who had their first panic attack about it during this time where it seemed like the world was ending. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful for that. And I appreciate the holistic approach. And of course, now if I could go back and, you know, I wasn't a child, I would say, okay, this is, you know, I need a 
go outside more. I don't know, yeah. you know, and, and, yeah, and yeah. you know, and, and keep working at those tools because I did have the, that help. So definitely not anti medication. Like, no, you need to get the help help you get. But also, I think also moving around so much and having to when I was in California, going to like a state hospital and them just being like, let's change your medication to this or that because I didn't have good health care. Um, so, you know, if any. I I went I I'm glad now that there's more information there's also more inf- misinformation out there of how to have more tools and be healthier cuz not everyone mm-hmm. can have you know good therapy um but anyway I just really appreciate that approach too of like cuz I it would be so cool if I could go back and have someone like you as a provider mm-hmm. and say and you know talk about sleep and um obviously different like you know, thought processing okay. tools and stuff like that, which I did, yeah. but it was more of like, it was like kind of all over the place, but um, that's so important. And it's so cool mm-hmm. that these all tie in. And my mom used to say to me, the mind and body are connected. Yeah. You know, hundred percent because 100%. you know, you have panic attack and you feel like you're gonna throw up or yeah. I can tell like I'm super tense a lot. Um, things like that where my mm-hmm. body is just kind of adapted to the state, but all good now, but I th- I'm glad that you have all these tools and you bring them together. And yeah. so that's so when people know that, like, you have to take your, I'm not saying don't do something. I'm saying if you're stuck in the situation that I was in. And um, I know you probably listen to the podcast you're like, well, that's really interesting. She was on them for 20 years. Um, but that's just what happened. And it, it was, it's, it it's was fine. so hard to get off. Yeah. And so it's more so like, people should know about the maybe long term so they don't end up in a situation like me. But you know, that's when you work with a doctor, hopefully for longer periods yeah. of time, except, you know, I moved a lot. So I think that's the the component with the clinician piece. Um and this is why I got into the field because of what you said, like that checklist and then handing medication. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what people believe my role is. Um and it's not like every single one of my patients has a form of like therapy when they see me. Um, Cause I truly do not believe like, if I don't ask all the questions, sleep, appetite, social life, if I don't academics, if I don't ask all the questions, I don't fully know what's going on. Someone can come in and this happens every single day. Like I'm wicked anxious or I'm having panic attacks. All right, well, let's back up. Where is everything at right now? Like, let's do some reflecting of, you know, all of the the things, the, the sleep, the appetite, the physical activity, the emotional outlets like journaling, yoga, meditation, what's happening socially, like looking at the triggers and kind of connecting the dots. Because if I just listen to like, I'm really anxious and I'm having panic attacks every day, that doesn't tell me anything. So I'm going to increase your medication for what? Nothing. Because yeah. most of the time, I don't need to increase the medication. I just need to identify the problem so that we can then adjust it in terms of skills and strategies. But when I have patients that have seen other providers, and I do think like I have a ton of colleagues and good friends in this field, and I do think it's to thank God turning. Um, but if they've had the experiences that you have and they come to see me, they will, it's funny because they'll be like, why are you asking me all these questions? You're not my therapist. Well, I know I'm not a certified therapist, but this is what I do. <laughs> um, so they get used to that really quick. Yeah. But I cannot and will not prescribe medication unless I have a full like breakdown of what's happening in someone's life in all areas. Um, and then to touch upon like the medical component, Brittany, because you mentioned like your thyroid and stuff too. Um, that's also important, you know, to find their past medical history, their family history, um, and then also to get you know, diagnostic initial labs done because a lot of underlying medical issues um, actually mimic signs and symptoms of depression or anxiety um, and thyroid being a big one. Yeah, that's so important to mention too, because I never really had any hormone issues Mm. until I was in my thirties. And as a woman, you know, we, we have a lot going on in our bodies. So I love that you do that because oftentimes like as a nutrition coach, like I'll have my clients get blood work and stuff Mm -hmm. and then they'll tell me like how much medication they're on. And one of my goals is not necessarily to get them off medication, but like you more of a holistic approach. So it's like, okay, well, like, what are you taking? What are you doing? Sleep, wake cycle, everything you said is so important. And yeah, 
like Christy said, I'm so thankful for you because part of the reason why I left pharma because I absolutely loved my job. I have ADHD. I was in outside sales. I was bouncing around to different offices, learning, just educating myself on something I cared about. But it really, really angered me. And I lost my passion for it when there were certain providers. Generally, I want to say that they were on the more old fashioned, older side mm -hmm. that just wanted to prescribe just wanted to write. They'd come in, they'd yeah. see patients for five minutes, they just write. So I have so much respect for you opening up your own practice and doing that. And with that being said, what are some of the challenges that you have seen and what has it been like going from when you worked in an office? Mm -hmm. I don't know what their process is or what I'm allowed to say <laughs> entirely. So you can kind of expand on that. And mm -hmm. then now working for yourself and getting to kind of have more freedom over whom you work with. What are some of the differences? So it was a little scary kind of pivoting um, and working for yourself. Um, I think the job I have, a, I, I have a wonderful ad administrator that takes care of like so much of my everyday like tasks that has been huge. So I can just focus on the patient. So that's taken a lot of stress off. Um, Versus me kind of doing all the things, including the patient care, which was just a lot. Um, but it's it hasn't changed. Like this day to day stuff is the same. So I literally like left one practice, opened up another one, and it was you know I'm the same practitioner. That didn't change. But the business end of it was it it and is still a learning curve. I mean, we're coming up on two years of me <laughs> me opening this up, and like every year around this time, tax season, I have like. <laughs> A ginormous oh amount of anxiety. And I'm like, is this, am I the only one? But then when I hear from like you guys, I'm like, all right, I'm not the only one that like, when it comes yeah. around, I want to go crawl under a rock and not have anything to do with it. So it's, it's different. I love it. Um, but I do need to like, you know, gain some more confidence in the business end of it. It's yeah. interesting too, because <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter what like industry you're in. It's like, oh, we're the we're the experts, we're the professionals at something. But also, all of a sudden, you're a businesswoman. You're like, wait, I have to do this too. And oh yeah, taxes, um, and like how to delegate things or how to hire someone or what kind of market. You know, you have to be. It's worth the money to delegate to other people that know yeah, what you're doing. Yeah, well, I was thinking too. I was like, assistant. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, well, I was just yeah, thinking that for you guys. Like, would it be helpful mm -hmm. if you guys? had, I mean, I know this is, you know, easier said than done, but like had an assistant to do the social media so that you weren't engrossed in it. Um, you know, and, and that stress is like kind of off your back. I mean, personally, like seeing how, what people say negatively, like that's alarming to me. And it's so, I don't know how you guys do what you do and put yourself out there. And I give you so much credit and because that takes a certain amount of resiliency. Um, and, and that's hard to balance, like, and keep your mental health in check. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, oh man, am I resilient? Or I'm just like <laughs> hard headed because I keep doing it anyway. <laughs> but you do see people out there, like maybe the more like internet popularity you get, the more feedback you're going to get, the more comments and you can either focus on the hate or the love. But um, the one thing with social media for me is I built the resilience not to get personally as much. Yeah. Maybe subconsciously in my head, I might be like, Oh, maybe I do look like a man or something. I'm not aware of it, but the mean comments, honestly, to me, I don't take it as personally, but it does make me feel a bit more negatively overall about the world. Right. I agree. So yeah. seeing all the negativity or seeing a negative comment on someone else's post makes me feel more grim, you know, about the world. But I mean, I don't even care anymore with the with the personal comments, but. Yeah. I, I, I can only imagine what you see with younger people who don't know maybe who they are yet, mm -hmm. um, how that's affecting their mental health and seeing those kind of things. I think it substantially affects them. I mean, everything from, you know, the comments that people, comments that people make, um, you know, also like just things that we think are simple, but adults do it too. Like, you know, they, they send a snap or they send a text and they're like, they left me unread. And I'm like, yeah, Okay. Like I, <laughs> all right, but that spikes their anxiety or causes, you know, more depressive symptoms. They get really low and that's an instant, those are the instant gratification. So if someone responds, they're like, 
you know, their serotonin goes up or whatever. And then when someone doesn't, it plummets. Um, and that's why you're seeing so many more people diagnosed with, you know, anxiety, depression, ADHD, because it's a constant stimulation. Um, and I do think that there is a huge component to like social mm-hmm. media there. But when you're also seeing people say things and behave the way they do, um, and sometimes people on like big formats that all the kids see, it's really hard to say like, that's not okay to do. And, you know, and they're like, well, this person does it. And they're this, you know, famous person. And it's hard to like, you know, d- tell them like what's right or wrong um, or how to, you know, handle themselves or behave. And especially when they're on these big platforms, easily mm-hmm. influenced. Do you, yeah. Do you think social media has kind of rewired rewired, you know, it's a very scientific term, rewired our brains at all? Because I definitely start to think of even before, like you said, that text message, when you can see if it's read or not, or even text mm-hmm. message at all, waiting for that boy to text me back, those kind of things. And now, um, you know, seeing the likes and the comments and, um, or, or checking the phone all the time, like, mm-hmm. is, have we been kind of rewired or, and is there a way to you know, unwire that? (laughs) I think we have, um, because I, because there are these surges in serotonin and dopamine when we are looking at the, the social media, um, you know, platforms. I, the good news is like, yes, if we like limit, we find that balance or we get rid of it entirely, like those surges are not happening anymore. Right. So that we're not spiraling or we're not creating these narratives in our head. Um, that create an increase in anxiety or low mood, um, especially with social media. Because we're first scrolling through social media, we see pictures. We create this narrative of this person that actually doesn't exist, but we have, you know, now formed this story that like everything is great, grand, and wonderful with them, and you know, my life is crap, which is not true. But it's that comparison train, and we do it to ourselves. And you know, not that we didn't have it before social media, but it was to like a much lesser degree than it is now. I mean, if we're looking through social media, we're doing a comparison, which never leads to good things, Mm -hmm. which then, you know, our anxiety goes up or we feel really bad about ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, I was just going to say that someone one time told me, once told me that it was called like pain shopping. You are going to go look at something in order to be jealous or, you know, you know, you're going you're gonna to look at this person to be jealous or feel a certain way, or, mm-hmm. or maybe you're looking to see if your boyfriend's liking other pictures or something like that. That would be pain shopping. It's interesting. Um, yeah. So one thing that's helped me too, is like, there's someone that I like, I kind of like, I have a I have like bad feelings about when I look at their stuff, you know, I just mute it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't want to see it. Cause like, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, we're unfollowed. Cause it's just, it's really not a big deal. I mean, I'm not going to notice mm-hmm. that anyone follows me, you know, if they don't like my stuff, unfollow me. But, um, I'm doing that to myself. Like I'm looking at it to get mad or mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. be sad at myself. So I, I try not, I'll, I'll catch myself like pain shopping and I'm like, Oh wait, don't do that. You yeah. know? Yeah. I think Waste that's another component. Like if there's things that trigger you, this is part of strategies and skills, social media wise, whether it's, you know, whatever follower friends or whatever, their family, if they're triggering you, their posts are triggering you, or you've had like an issue with them, they are a trigger. So like, unfollow them mute them like you have to totally disconnect in order to kind of like heal and think clearly around that um you want to eliminate the problem you know entirely to help with your anxiety and depression like if seeing this person's post is increasing your anxiety or anger or whatever get rid of the problem and we have the ability Mm -hmm. to do that something that i personally feel is so hard that i'm always working on but i still have very high anxiety about it ever since COVID and having my own business is the need to respond. So I will feel, let's say I have a client check-in and they check in, you know, Mondays by this time. I'll see it in my inbox, but it's like, I have an outline for the day that I do with my ADHD brain. I really try to stick with so that I can get all moving parts of my business done. So sometimes though, I'll feel guilty. It's like, they have, a, they have a question, but it's not, it doesn't need an immediate response, but like I need to post on social media or I need to publish this article or, you know, do something else or even get my own workout in. And it's like, I feel this, this dread and this guilt. And I know a lot of people feel this way because of 
the instant gratification of Mm -hmm. social media. I've had people even tell me before, like, oh, well, the coach was posting on social media, but didn't answer my email. And it's like, okay, well, what's their policy? So it's just, and I think this goes into many, many jobs now that people work remotely. You know, I remember when I was working a corporate job when COVID first happened, we'd have like 6 a.m. Zoom meetings and we almost were getting like more micromanaged because it's like people think just because we're home, it's like there's no separation or balance. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you have any advice from what you do with your patients for people that have, you know, ADHD, depression, anxiety, it's, you know, lots of comorbidities Mm -hmm. and there's obviously a direct connection to social media and you know, checking and the dopamine hits we get. Do you have any advice aside from just finding a balance? Is there any coping mechanisms that you find work really well? I think that's all very individualized, truthfully. So each patient is is very different um, in terms of that. So what I do is I, I give them the information. Here's the knowledge. Here's like some stuff that have worked personally for me. Um, I think exercise is like the one thing that's like, kind of non-negotiable, but like the exercise can be anything. Just move your body. I'm not saying you have to go to the mm-hmm. gym and lift 200 pounds. I'm not saying you have to go running. Most of the, pe- most of the time people are like, I don't want to go to the gym. I said, then don't go to the gym. Go for a walk, put on some music and dance. I do. You have to have a physical outlet and you need to have an emotional outlet and they need to be consistent, you know, because consistency builds habits and that helps you maintain the day-to-day stressors that can spike up your anxiety decrease your mood or increase your ADHD. Um, You have to have that maintenance. So pick one. Here's a list. You can also like Google, you know, what they are. Mm -hmm. But all this stuff is, especially anxiety and ADHD is energy and it needs to go somewhere and you need to have that outlet. So it needs to physically get out of your body because it obviously affects your body. And then it also mentally, emotionally has to get out. So what that looks like is you know, journaling or meditating or yoga or people like write poetry or play music. Those are your emotional outlets. You need to have that in conjunction with your physical outlets, especially when you're you're starting off. Sometimes the emotional outlets will drop depending on the person and then they, you know, pick back up if like someone's going through like, you know, a high like stress time. Um, but there needs to be like that consistency in those two outlets um, in order to be able to like better manage you know, everyday life. Um, that's, and that's first and foremost. And then I think going back to like your email component too, or like strategies around that and the urgency is uh, for me, if I get emails that are not, um, emergencies, especially on the weekends, I star them. Like they don't get, I do not answer them. They get answered on Monday. And it's just having that self-discipline of like, you don't need to answer right away. This is not, you know, a matter of life or death, like though, you know, yeah. they'll get an answer on Monday and keeping those boundaries. Boundaries is huge. That's a healthy thing to do. And that's also part of like critical to our mental health. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, I kind of want to change gears a little bit because <laughs> all my, like we were talking about ads and stuff on social media. So after Christy and I published our episode, I've been, and Christy mentioned it too, she was getting so many ads what are your thoughts on some of the emerging trends and future directions in, in mental health care? For example, you know, there's been a lot of talk on like ketamine therapy, mm. psilocybin, all that. I know Huberman speaks of them. So I feel like they've become more popular. I don't know if you want to mention anything or just I would love to hear your opinion on those. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're all it's all interesting. I don't I try not to like place any sort of opinion on like like those I'm going to call them like non-traditional um, treatments because I don't know enough about them to do it. I've had some patients that went through ketamine treatments. Um, I would say, and, and this is my own, my personal experience as a clinician with these patients, there wasn't much of a difference, um, but there obviously is a lot of research out there that like shows that there there is and it's helpful for some people. So I do feel like this is also very individualized and I want people to feel like they have um, the comfort, like the comfortableness to say, like, I don't want to go on medication. I don't want to continue on medication. I want to try this route. And I'm open to that because again, it's about you and how you feel. I don't know how you feel. I'm not your, in your body, but you do. And I'm going to listen and respect that and, you know, tell you what I can about it. But, um, I think that if you want to explore that under, you know, 
you know, clinician supervision and doing it safely, then absolutely. Um, I don't think that anything is off the table, like, you know, from ketamine treatments to like going to get acupuncture. It's all, it's all part of, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's really individualized of what you, you want to do or how you want to go about this, you know, process of, you know, healing. Yeah. I love that. It's kind of just like Christy and I as coaches, it's like, got to figure out what works for the specific person. You know, Mm -hmm. not everyone's going to get results off super high volume. Not everyone's, if they're a beginner, you know, they might be able to max out more than someone that's been exercising and lifting for several years. So I love that. And I want, I had a couple questions that I want to jump to um, directly from social media, but first I wanted to see Chrissy, is there anything else that you, that I maybe missed that you want to ask Stacey? Um, not really. I was actually just over here thinking about, um, um, again, just to kind of wrap up with, uh, the, when I came off the SSRIs Mm -hmm. and, you know, I did not have much help from doctors. Every doctor I'd go to would just be more of a general doctor and they'd say, Oh, decrease the dose a little bit, you know, each week. Um, you know, do you know how common maybe like it is for people to have trouble coming off? Of Great question. Well, am I super rare? Yeah. Is it, you no. know, for me, I'm thinking we're doing this podcast and I'm going to tell my story and, you know, a bunch of people are going to relate to it. Or am I one of like a few, you know, should I not be ringing the bell, sounding the alarm, <laughs> you know, like, I feel like there's probably a lot of people out there that's been on antidepressants for 15 years or something you know so and, and so like how common it is for someone to be prescribed for very long and then how um you know how many people might have trouble you know maybe it's like oh well past obviously a year it might be harder to come off you know yeah, yeah. I really thought I really thought I would never be able to, like it was so hard I thought I would never be able to go off mm-hmm. go off just because the symptoms it was so debilitating through my day-to-day mm-hmm. now I'm fine I feel fine, but um, I think I think I'm okay. Um, but yeah, just how so <laughs> how common is that? Yeah, I'm just me. You know, like you said, we're all kind of like we all might have a little ADD or anxiety, but it's just how much does it affect your life, right? So we manage it. Um, yeah, is it is it a it's, common it's, issue? Is it is it yeah. just rare? No, it's not rare. It's it's very common for people to have what we call withdrawal um, side effects coming down and off the medication. Um, it really is dependent. Like, there's a lot of factors that go in. One is like how sensitive somebody is to the medication. You know, how they metabolize it, how long they've been on it, um, and how they're going about the taper. So, if I've had somebody on it for like a long time, let's just say 20 years, and I'm trying to taper them off, I am going to go like very slow um so like it could sometimes it can just be like by milligrams you know what I mean so that they don't like not 10 milligrams not 5 milligrams not 20 milligrams which is sometimes how we ramp these up every few weeks um I you know depending on the person will can do it by milligram um and not like bi-weekly like sometimes every month, like letting it kind of stabilize so that the person is not uncomfortable. Um, It's very individualized. I've had some people that I can like knock off like 5, 10, 20 milligrams at a time. And they're like, I'm fine. They don't have the brain zaps. They don't have anything. I have somebody who like, I'll do like two milligrams and they have the brain zaps. So it's like very different. And then I just have to kind of curtail the tapering process to that individual. And it's really based on their sensitivity to it. So you are, it's, it's very, very common. Um, and one of the biggest questions I get for like that type of like withdrawal, because when some people miss their medication, they will have those type of symptoms, the brain zaps, Mm -hmm. sometimes like flu, like symptoms, headache and increase in anxiety. Um, and they're often like my, you know, I'm dependent on it. My body is like reliant on it. Um, your body's adjusting, but when you are on a certain milligram for X amount of time and you forget to take it, you're we'll just take SSRIs, your serotonin is like going from like, let's just say 10 milligrams of Prozac daily to, you know, nothing. Um, Prozac was a bad example because it has a long half-life, but nonetheless, like your body, your, your body is going to be like, what's happening? You know, that's why it needs that specific, like slow taper up and the same thing with the slow taper down. Um, 
and yeah. it's just a, it's an adjustment back with the with the neurotransmitters in your in your brain if you go too fast they're like what's happening mm -hmm. I appreciate the validation because I really <laughs> was one of those people very sensitive to it mm -hmm. where I did feel like I am to, my body is just it's part of my bot, my chemistry now. Like uh, this is going to be impossible because of just, if I missed one dose, you know, it was like game over. Um, so anyway, I just want to, you know, hear your input, your actual, actual expertise on that. <laughs> Cause I'm sure you've seen a lot of people in it yeah. that that's uh, been through, been through that. And again, just to reiterate, um, not against medication. I just want someone to have a little hope if they're going through that with their doctor with tapering off because it was hard. Um, mm -hmm. I, hopefully these days, not many people will become in my situation. Hopefully there's more practitioners like you. Um, and then also for people to just get a good idea of, you know, what, um, good treatment would look like, mm -hmm. um, you know, not just the medication or, you know, I feel like there's always so many different sides. Like I've looked at the very, like no medication, like very, very holistic route. And then also, um, you know, people were just like, do the checklist medication. So yeah. it's good that, um, you know, it doesn't need to be like, you don't need to be on either side. You can have a combination of treatments and just totally as long as you're yeah. working at it, you know, I'll have a so, lot of people. That was come to my see. last question there. No, it's okay. I have a lot of people that will come to see me and they're not ready for medication. They want to go, you know, and I encourage them like, mm -hmm. here's all the holistic things and approaches that you can do. Go do that first, because if that works, then you don't need medication. And if you've tried all the mm -hmm. things, then you're actually going to be more open to medication. Mm -hmm. And that also tells you that it's a chemical component that, mm -hmm. you know, you could benefit from. So I, I encourage all of that, especially if someone's not comfortable with mm -hmm. medication yet, like, let me give you the information, the mm -hmm. education. Um, and then you do what you want with that. This is not you know, anything but information. You do the thing. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I did before I took thyroid medication mm -hmm. was try to lay the foundation of health um, to support my thyroid. Unfortunately, it, I still had to put, use medicine, but yeah. you know, at least the foundation is there. I'm not just like throwing a medication on top of Agreed. it. I'm yeah. trying to live a lifestyle conducive that make, make my, you know, help my thyroid. But, um, cause it, because it wasn't at a, at a level where it was like, Oh my God, you need intervention now. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just very low. So I, I like think that approach a lot. Yeah. No, it's a good approach. And I think like, like the thyroid, the brain's no different, you know, like you, you try all the things and if they're not working, like going on medication is not a defeat. So many people look at it as defeating. It's a tool like you, you know, chemically cannot make that serotonin, that dopamine, that norepinephrine, whatever you're lacking on your own. And it's a tool to help you be able to then get the clarity, bridge the gap, use the tools, and most importantly, gain the confidence back so that like you have the tools, you have your confidence to like go on with life and deal with anxiety, depression, and what life has in store for you um, when you come off the medication. That's the goal. Yeah. I'm always very open and honest, and I've struggled with ADHD and sleep since I was a little kid. Like, I can remember mm -hmm. being, like, seven and waking up at 2 a.m. Like, that was normal and just reading <laughs> books or doing push-ups. Yeah, no, my whole life. My mom, my mom, it definitely is genetics. I remember my mom would be, yeah. like, they had they had a very weird very weird sleep wake cycle but about a year ago i really wanted to get like my sleep in check and it is something that i have to work on just as hard as i have to work on my physical fitness my sleep mm -hmm. because it takes me so long to shut my brain down and there are times especially when i'm traveling a lot in various time zones that i do need sleep medication. And I can tell you mm -hmm. it has been a life changing because there has been days where I've been up for three days straight. Yeah. And it has been life changing in terms of helping me manage my anxiety. And I still even now will have like this, this guilt where it's like, Oh, why do I need medication? What's wrong with me? And I'm like, you know what? Everyone has something. I rather take something and be able to sleep and have my anxiety go down versus staying up for several days. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a tool. It's a tool. You know, it's just one of, it's a strategy. You know, if you know you're up for three days, yeah, you're going to want to do something about that. Mm -hmm. um, some of the questions I had, some of them are worded a little bit funny, but okay. someone asked, was on Lexapro 
for 14 months off and on was life changing. However, I gained weight. Mm-hmm. And then the, the second, sorry, it's two parts, even with exercise and diet staying the same had to get off because of the weight gain. Any advice if I do decide to go back on? Um, so I would say if you're, you know, exercise and diet is on point, um, the SSRIs do have a you know side effect of of weight gain for some people, not all people. I do find that hormones play a role in that for for women. So like my perimenopausal or my postmenopausal um, women tend in to gain weight um, for sure, and it's because those the serotonin receptors that are in your brain, um, most of them are made in your gut. It's like 70 or 80%. Don't quote me on like the exact percentage. But um, because of that, it does, it can create um, an increase in like hunger, but also like craving carby, like sugary foods. Um, And that's where you can kind of see the weight gain. When you take the Lexapro away, you're no longer kind of triggering those receptors. So then, you know, the weight will kind of slowly come, come off. So anytime a medication is triggering the rate, the weight gain, once you eliminate it, the weight will slowly like, will rectify. Um, To go back on it, um, if it was helpful for you, I would ask the person like what the dose was. I mean, theoretically, hopefully, like, because it was helpful, they wouldn't need as much. So sometimes it is dose dependent. Um, So a lower dose may not cause the weight gain and if they can get away with it. Um, the other pieces, like they were being treated for anxiety or depression, um, you know, and they need another medication intervention and they have to go to that same level of Lexapro, then I would suggest going to like a more weight neutral medication if they can, you know, tolerate it. And this is in another class, like an SNRI, um, if they're looking for both an antidepressant anti anxiety route. Or if they're just treating depression, sometimes Wellbutrin's really good for that. It's, you know, weight neutral. Um, but if they're just treating anxiety, Buspirone is also um, really good and weight neutral. Um, so it's really dependent on what we're treating it for, um, for sure. But those are some mm-hmm. options. And I would just it's talk with the clinician. Yeah. Thank you. It's interesting, yeah. too, because I'm obviously not the expert. But when I'm, when I'm gathering data from my clients, I have had no males that I can think of, but I have a couple of people, examples offhand of females that have gone on medication and that actually helped them with some of their binge eating. Cause oftentimes they're mm-hmm. reaching for like really high carb foods to get that dopamine rush. So I think that it can go both ways. Just, just my opinion. Totally. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. Um, another question, I don't know if you'll know the answer. Um, do PEDs affect antidepressants? Keep in mind, a lot of my audience are athletes competing, et cetera. Um, I can't, I, I don't know. I mean, what, no, it's, that's totally what fine. type yeah. are they using? <laughs> I know that's, that's a very um, broad question. <laughs> I would need more, I would well, need more specifics on that. Um, I think like, I, I don't know what they're referencing to. Um, yeah. So I can't really very broad. I think it's hard too with those kind of things too, because you can't really study the PEDs, right? Because if they're not, if the, if the PEDs aren't, if they're not, if they're not a type that's legal, you're not going to like study them on, you know, have, have the, them in a study, right? So. Um, but yes and no. I mean, there's like, obviously like steroids and stuff of that nature definitely mm-hmm. play a huge role in our hormones. And then that in turn plays a whole role in our anxiety okay. and our mood. Um, so that, mm-hmm. I mean, the data is there for that. Um, right. Other okay. specific ones, I don't, I can't speak to. Um, I think anything that's messing around with like our hormones potentially is going to impact our mental health in some way. And you just need to like really closely monitor that. Like where's everything at for anxiety, irritability, mood wise. Yeah, completely agree. And there's often the term like roid rage thrown around. Mm -hmm. And I'm obviously, again, not an expert, not claiming to be, but it's like, you have to look at your whole history, your, you know, of everything to see how that can affect you and have coping mechanisms in place. Um, Another question I got was, 
have tried numerous medications over the years that seemed to really help. However, all negatively affected my sex drive to the point Mm. where I couldn't even feel anything and felt dull. Any advice on this? This, um, So there are some um, neutral ones that don't necessarily affect the libido or the sex drive. Um, I'd have to know like what they've tried in order to recommend, you know, um, alternatives to it for sure. Again, it, it can be, you know, can be dose dependent, like how little medication can you get away with, with it still creating like, you know, a therapeutic, um, you know, environment for you. Um, but I'd have to know specifics to be able to, to say sometimes yeah, no, totally conditions will adjunct, um, with other medication to help with that. I don't love doing that by any means, unless like someone's like really had like life-changing effects on that medication. And this is like a barrier. Um, I do not like polypharmacy. If I can, if I can keep it to like one and done, that's where I'm going to stay. Um, but what? It's, it's oh, hard. Sorry. Go <laughs> no, go ahead. No, it's just hard with, you know, having a side effect like that too. Cause then that impacts, you know, mentally as well. So. Mm-hmm. Any natural supplementation you can recommend for anxiety and depression for day-to-day deal- dealings? I don't think yeah. Yeah, somebody's just word log, <laughs> but I guess they're just asking anything we recommend do. that's not, yeah, not pharmacology. That's holistic. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a ton. I mean, obviously 30 minutes of exercise daily, um, at least 10 minutes of sunlight, um, good sleep-wake cycle, mindfulness. Um, you know, socializing is huge too, like positive socialization. Those are just like things you can focus on. Um, probiotics, really good, like for gut health. You want to have a good, you know, healthy gut that influences our anxiety and our mood. Um, magnesium is very just helpful for anxiety. Um, also for, for depression, um, vitamin D is great. Um, L-theanine is actually what's in green tea. Uh, it, it works for on anxiety. You can take that up to like three times a day. Um, fish oil, really good. Um, that's also good for ADHD as well because mm-hmm. it hits like the prefrontal cortex. Um, 5-HTP can be helpful for anxiety for some people. Um, SAM-E, you know, everybody's individualized. You got to kind of look at this and talk to your doctors too. Like don't you know? Yeah. For me personally, I've maybe played a little pharma on myself. Um, <laughs> I love, I, I do notice a big difference. I take a very high omega with, um, DHA, mm-hmm. take it at nighttime, magnesium, 5-HTP. And, um, another good one for me has been ashwagandha, yeah. um, making yeah. sure my vitamin D levels in check. But oftentimes like when I'm looking through a client supplement protocol, they'll forget that like, they may be taking a, a, a vitamin D, but it might be like the Kirkland brand and you also need vitamin K to help get the full benefits. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's like, I always advise people like, make sure you're working with someone you trust, know yeah, what you're taking absolutely. and then know that there's counteractions to everything. Right. I would do, you know, for the specific question, like work with the things that you can manage right now, which is your exercise, your sunlight, uh, mindfulness, sleep balanced, um, diet, and then, you know, talk to a clinician about these supplements, but most importantly, like get a baseline of where your labs are at too, and see what your, you know, might be deficient in that could be helpful and, and start there. Um, and then that way there, like you're not bombarded with 900 supplements, but like, you know, your vitamin D might be low. So why don't we start, you know, there, your B, mm-hmm. you know, vitamin B. Um, the last question, there was some that just, I don't really know how to make sense of, but the last question was, <laughs> basically asking, um, hi, Brittany, thank you for all the content. Appreciate it. I am looking to get pregnant within the next one to two years. I've been on SSRI for nearly six years, as well as ADHD medication. I know I will need to come off part two. Where's part two? Could you please ask who you interview, what they recommend do not want to have a baby if this will be life altering back to how I used to be. Hmm. It's a good question. Um, I get, get that a lot. Um, there's so much advancements in this area now, like medications that, you know, we thought were like tetragenic or not good for the baby are now like people are able to be on like 
bipolar medications and stuff of that nature, which is huge under, um, you know, clinicians, mental health clinicians that are specific to pregnancy or maternity. Um, so with the SSRIs, it's, you can be on them. Sometimes it's, you know, getting off them is more detrimental to the mother and the, and the baby because of, you know, the impact of like anxiety or depression it would have on the body. So staying on them, um, you know, obviously is, is more vital. Um, you know, you do want to, you know, have the clinician closely monitor and work with like your OB, or you can go see, um, you know, a clinician that's specific to, um, women who are pregnant to, to closely monitor, but they are, they are safe as long as, you know, someone's keeping an eye on it. Um, the only SSRI that like you can really like breastfeed with is Zoloft um, or sertraline. So the other ones, um, you know, if my patients are going to stay on an SSRI, um, either like early on in their pregnancy or even before, sometimes I'll switch them over to Zoloft if they, they know they want to breastfeed um, because the other ones go right through to the breast milk. So. Awesome. Thank you. Well, that's all I have for questions on there. Yes. Any closing remarks you want to leave the audience with? Maybe if someone is struggling, like what's a good first step for them to take or anything else that you want to say? Yeah, I think it's vital that people like know that there's help out there and that everybody struggles um, to some degree. And if it's, you know, whatever it may be that's getting in your the way of your everyday life, like, you know, you owe it to yourself to to talk to somebody, you know, whether it's a therapist or, you know, somebody that, you know, you want to explore medication or, or talk more about it, you owe that to yourself. You want to get healthy. It, it's really validating and, and helpful, even if you don't go the medication route. Um, but most importantly, like when you are like interviewing therapists or clinicians, because it is an interview process, you need to feel comfortable with that person. Make sure you're being listened to, like they're hearing you. They're not gaslighting you. They're not dismissing you. Like you want to feel heard because um, this is all about you and has nothing to do with the clinician or the therapist. Um, you want to make sure that like you're in the driver's seat um, and you feel comfortable with whoever is providing you care. Good reminder for sure. Chrissy, is there any other questions or comments that you want to add? Um, no, I just appreciate your time. It's cool. so valuable. Um, that was awesome. I feel enlightened as well. And I think <laughs> it's really important too, because here's the thing. A lot of us like use the weight in place of therapy, sure. you know, or I don't know why they quotes. We, you know, we <laughs> weights are our therapy is what I mean. Yeah. Um, and personally, the last few years, I finally tried to slow down and work on my own mental health. And I know it's hard to hear too, but a lot of people, if you're really struggling, you feel like you're hitting your head against a wall, like, you know, and you're just going into the gym. If you're not motivated to help yourself, <laughs> I promise you that working on your mental health is kind of like the foundation of the health and then also your fitness as well. Mm -hmm. Like you were talking about the mind body connection is important. So if you're not motivated to get help for yourself, start by doing it to help your performance. And then eventually you go, <laughs> Hey, my whole life is getting so much better. Cause I know a lot of us don't see out of that. We really, yeah. I know I, the reason I, you know, struggle so much, cause I really had tunnel vision on this one mm -hmm. uh, fitness goal, strength goal. Mm. So I'm so glad you said there's help out there. I hope people can see this and see, hey, like Stacy's not scary at all. I like the stuff she's saying. Like I, maybe there's more people like the, out there that can help me, um, you know, and have my best interest in mind. So yeah, I just want to thank you so much for your time and um, and keep on hammering home that like I do think that the mental health is kind of the foundation for everything else. Totally. Um, more more important than lifting any weight ever. So yeah, thank you. Hands yeah, thank down. You for me. Hands down. And for our listeners, we would really appreciate if you would share this episode. Like I always say, I don't think mental health is talked enough about in the physical fitness world. I've been a high caliber athlete my whole life. And, you know, I've I've witnessed suicides. I've witnessed myself, my own clients struggle. So we would really appreciate if you would pass this episode around. So thank you so much for listening. And just a little side note, Christy and I are extremely busy the next month. So if you have any 
topic requests, we will most likely be resuming probably not for a few weeks. We always want to make sure that our content is valuable and we're not rushing anything. So you can anonymously submit your topic requests. And when our life slows down a little bit, we both have some trips and some business things and tax season planned. So <laughs> hang in there. And again, we appreciate the support. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.